This house is the key, we whipping it up. This house is the key, we cooking it up. This house is the key, we cooking it up. Hey, hey. Hey, welcome back to another edition of The Sauce. I am Derek Maines. This is Andrew Kolikoff. Well, uh, welcome back. Uh, today we're gonna talk a little bit, we promised we would talk about this. We were talking about what your superpower is as an entrepreneur or business owner. And today we wanna take that to the next level and that is the thing that uh, we have to be concerned about. What's your kryptonite? And <clears throat> this is a topic I think that's really important because Many times in business, we try to be a little bit of a jack of all trades, and that uh, might be necessary early on, but it is bad for business as you grow and get bigger and older and more matured. Uh, so let's chat about this and how you overcome this, how do you identify what those things are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic to you first. Okay, so here comes the vulnerability episode. Uh -oh. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is that look, it is what it is. If I'm going to reveal my kryptonite, it's pretty vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, there's my self perceived view of my weaknesses and my kryptonite. And then, of course, there's other people's view of what they think it might be, right? Yeah. And I always, when I coach people, I always make sure that I have them get that feedback from their people in their inner circle to sure. make sure that their perception of their strengths and weaknesses aligns with other people's. But that's not what we're doing today. But I just wanted to throw that in. So so mine. It's good to know, though. Thing. I mean, it really is because I think there's blind spots. I think we all have blind spots. Uh, you, yours is your barking <laughs> dog. Hey, hey. excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to uh, post COVID. Having That's a right. Go. Working hey, from home. Get down. Get down. Mm -hmm. Get down. So um, here are two. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure there are more, but for me, there are two. And I'm going to start by explaining it. For most people that have a, for people that have a dog. Okay. When you've ever played sock with a dog, tug. <laughs> Tug yep. with a sock, right? Yeah. Excuse me. Hey, get down. <laughs> um, He's, you're talking about dogs, man. You, you can't ask dog. him not to participate. There's my dog. His name is Jet. So, hey, Jet. Um, I am like the dog that you're playing sock with that is so <laughs> persistent that you, you, you ever <laughs> sometimes play, okay. He knows he's not. <laughs> Get down. He's looking out the window, and there's another dog. Ah, so well, this see. is perfect. So this anyway, is his kryptonite. Anyway, um, you know when you're getting really heated oh. in that tug with your dog, that you can yeah. maybe even lift your dog up off the ground, and the dog is still like yanking on it with its hind legs dangling yeah. off the ground, right? Yep. So in a way, that's me. I don't know when to let go sometimes um, when I'm focused on something that is, um, you know, Seth Godin wrote a book called The Dip. And I don't know. Did you ever read that book? I don't think I've ever read that book. No, it's it's a really interesting book. I don't know if everything in it. I agree with, but it's a fascinating book. And it basically explains how leaders should know when to quit sooner rather than mm. that quitting actually makes good sense in business. You I'm know, downloading and, the book right now. <laughs> and we're so, um, you know, I think it's so part of our, everything we hear in life is never give up. Never give up. Yeah, the perseverance and the hustle right. and all that kind of stuff. Don't and, give up. Don't listen to what yeah. other people are saying. And what I've learned is I've learned to, you know, give up when it makes sense to. So that's a kryptonite for me. I'll, I'll still fight for things that maybe aren't really worth fighting for anymore. Mm -hmm. So, so. That would be one. Another one I would say, Derek, hey, another one 
I, I'm going to put him, I think, in his room. Hey. Okay. Go ahead. We'll take a break for a Hold second. On, audience. <laughs> Come here. I'm going to show you the dog first, everybody. There you go. Bring the, bring bring Jet into the frame here. Where is it? Hi, Jet. Why? Is oh, he's calmed down now. Say hello, everybody. Hey, Jet. Okay. What's happening, Jet bro? You're going, our guest guest Jet is today. Going, he's going in the room. So okay. <laughs> So, my other one, I think, Derek, would be um, not letting people, not that allowing for a pause after people speak. Hmm. In other words, I'm not listening deep enough sometimes. Um, and as we talked about in previous episodes, if you remember, we need to learn as leaders, listening not to respond, but listening to understand, hmm. right? That is maybe yeah. one of the greatest skills. And I can interrupt people sometimes only because I'm so in the moment of the conversation that I don't sometimes let it breathe enough. Hmm. So, and that obviously has ramifications. Right. So those would be probably my self-perceived biggest two that I'm always working on yeah. is knowing when to quit um, and stop fighting for something. Um, and the other one um, in yeah. allowing for pause after people speak. I think I think the allowing for pause after people speak is really difficult, um, particularly for me because I'm very used to hosting, and what that means is that there can't be pauses uh, in the conversation. That you have to be. I was talking to another host here recently, and she said the same thing. She's like, the time when the guest is talking is the time where you're formulating the next aspects of the show. You're thinking about the next questions. You're watching the clock. You're trying to, to, to time things out. So I, I also struggle with that. Uh, I think it's one of the reasons, and you know, I'll get really vulnerable here. I, I joined an improv class back in January, and last night was our last class. And I have to tell you, I, I literally despised every moment of that class, hated it. <laughs> I'm so glad it's over. Uh, we were supposed to do our showcase next week. It got moved to last night. Fortunately, I had a conflict and I was able to get out of it. But I just detest it. And I detest it because I am very hyper trained to be listening with one ear and formulating the next response with the other and an improv, you cannot do that. You absolutely cannot do that. And it was so frustrating to me and so disheartening and so um, awkward that I, I just was ready for it to be over. Uh, to me, I feel like I'm the kind of person that needs autonomy, mastery, and purpose. I've got to be self-directed. I have to have a reason to do things. I have to be able to master it and get better at it over time. And candidly, improv, I got worse every single time. So you don't just, feel you gained anything nothing. or insights or things that you knew about yourself that you thought you could polish up? That's a great question, Andrew. And you broke up there for a second. You froze. So hopefully you'll come Sorry. back. But um, I think what I learned, and, and this is, you know, I've been talking about this a lot lately as well, is this year I decided to, to, to see a therapist uh, because I just wanted to understand the whole process, right? And, and my therapist has challenged me to become an expert at being uncomfortable. And, uh, and, and you know, I, although I agree with him that that is a very – nice thing to learn how to do. Uh, I, I am uncomfortable in many things that I do, but, but if I can't obtain mastery 
over that thing relatively quickly, I get very frustrated with it. So I think the thing that I learned about myself in this process, Andrew, was that I am very rehearsed. I did not realize how rehearsed I am. I have hundreds of stories, thousands of little quips that I can pull in uh, and, and I keep track of them. I, I, I write 10 or 15 of them a day, little tiny statements of things to remember to, to say in conversation. And I never realized how, uh, how rehearsed and scripted I was. Um, and uh, I mean, I ask, like, I literally, there's just, I have a list of just questions that, I, that are interesting questions to ask people in conversation. And, and I have my own answers to those that I've formulated and developed over time. So to me, I just found that I'm not very comfortable in those type of situations where I am called on the carpet to talk about something that I'm not an expert in. I don't know if, you know, there's this question of, should I try to get over that? Uh, I don't know if it, beho- it behooves me to get over it. I, it's just a well, weakness I mean, to have, I, and I'm not good I, at it. I would push back um, a little for you is the thing that I, you know, I do a lot of coaching too. Yep. And the best sessions happen when I either bring nothing to this session, mm-hmm. intentionally so, just to listen, and trust myself enough to know that the right response for me as a coach will show up. The right ideas, the right way to look at it. And I will tell you, it takes a lot of courage to do that because it isn't scripted. There's great discomfort for me in doing that. I mean, people are paying me very good money to show up and take them from here to hear. And I, I tell every client that I take on that there will be some sessions where I will come with nothing. I'll just ask you how things are going. We'll talk about some basic questions. And it forces me to be present and listen to where you're at now and rely on my experience and wisdom to serve you in the manner in which I'm supposed to serve you. And it's incredibly uncomfortable, (laughs) incredibly uncomfortable because we, you and I love information. We're information aholics, right? We love perspective. We love ideas and we love the integration of those ideas. But I will tell you, you have accumulated, and this is where my pushback is of you. You are more well-read than most. You are more articulate than most. And you have a deeper perspective of self than most. And I would tell you to learn how to trust that more than to script everything out. I mean, being an operations guy, which is probably your single best skill, is all about thinking things out. It's all about, you know, scripting everything. You're scripting the business. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah, and I think I think if I look, you know, I'm I'm a big believer in in self awareness. I mean, I I love to uh, to sit back and you know spend quality time, sort of you know thinking about the lessons in my own life and trying to apply those and learn from that wisdom. Although I'm not a big believer in failure, I don't believe that it is possible to technically fail. Um, I, I think it's really more about taking those life lessons, but you know, one of the things I like to do is I love to talk to psychologists and I love to get their opinion on me because I believe it really helps me better understand myself. And I, I've done, you know, all of the TTIs, you know, I, I, yeah, my, but like culture index is a great example. And Kim Watson, who I know that, you know, as well, you know, my, my profile, I am incredibly gregarious. I'm like a, in the one one thousandth of a percent, right? I'm incredibly logical in the one one thousandth of a percent. I'm also um, terrible at detail orientation and patience. 
Uh, those are just genetically encoded in me that I am not good at those things. So is that the, your kryptonite? It you is think? truly my you kryptonite. Think you're a detail oriented. <clears throat> No, I'm not at all. But here's the funny thing. I will tell you, I've had psychologists tell me this over the years that have looked at my, that, that have looked at like psychological profiles for me. And they say that I'm very logical and very, um, I, I have a high level of ingenuity and a high level of logic, which people that have that tend to cover up their inefficiencies and their kryptonites by constructing things that mislead people to think that they are good at those things. And isn't it funny that I'm an operations guy, uh, very detail oriented. Everything about my whole career is all about details and, uh, and, and, and patiently awaiting to find the solution and digging deeper. So the things that I'm the worst at, I've recognized that I have to systematize those things in order to do them successfully. And I do, I, I, I use a lot of systems personally because those things do, the, the, I, I can actually feel them drain my energy when I have to do detail oriented work. So, but, but I look for the logic and ingenuity in them to, to, to boost my morale so that I can get through them. I, I think that's a lesson that everybody can learn is taking things that you're not good at and prioritizing them and using the things that you are good at to, I don't want to say cover up, but to, to essentially accentuate and systematize those things so that you can give the illusion that you're an expert at them. And, and fortunately, I have become an expert at them over time, even though they're not things that are part of my personality, if that makes sense. So I totally can relate to everything yeah. you just said. So for the audience that doesn't know, I'm a former chief science officer, two graduate degrees, university adjunct professor, all in science. And science is very detail-oriented. <laughs> and, and, you know, it didn't come natural for me. I thought growing up that you just... Over, you know, you work hard and you can achieve anything, right? That's what they tell you. Sure, that's what I was taught. Achieve. That's what I was taught. And I was not a great test taker. I did not do well on my SAT or GREs. Um, I did not have a 4.0. I did pretty well in my master's, I think, um, GPA wise. But uh, I, I had to work harder than most other people because the detail was hard for me. Yeah. And, um, and then when I worked my way up the corporate ladder, everything was so much of a grind. I thought I had to do it all myself and figure it all out myself, only to later realize, like you, people perceived me as this detail-oriented, geeky nerd but really what I was better at was just like you, was the higher level thinking and how to apply that to move mountains, yes. right? right? And that's what you do, Derek. You're in the mountain yeah. moving business. And I didn't realize I, that's who I was. I didn't know that was my kryptonite. I mm. thought I just had to work harder. That's all I thought. And I didn't realize that that's not who I am and how my brain works. So I shifted my life more towards, like you say, the gregariousness and the inquisitiveness and the creative ideas based on the problems and challenges and to bring people in and no longer do that work. Yeah, and totally. That's the key. <clears throat> it really is a key. But I think there's an ego part to it that we didn't discuss. I think when people invest so much of their lives in something, it's hard to come to terms with, wow, maybe I'm not the greatest gift in this. Maybe I'm not as yeah. good as I think. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. And then it takes courage not only to look at that. Oh, it sure does. But to change course. Yeah. No, I think you're so dead on here. And, and it's why the people that I hire, I have psychological profiles done on them. And I look for people that have the opposite characteristics that I have. Why? Because 
Uh, if I can find people that have high patience and high detail orientation, then I have people that I can delegate that kind of work to, which will allow me to focus on the bigger, more strategic things. Uh, I'll give you a little little quip here. One of the most influential things that I ever learned was the difference between energy and approach. There's only two things that you can affect every day with your relationships, with your business, with your life, and that's energy or approach. Energy is a finite resource that you will run out of. And the older you get, the, the more that you understand that energy is something that is diminishing. Um, so spending energy on things is extremely valuable because you have such an incredibly small amount of it. But changing your approach to things is infinite. Uh, you look at the CEOs like Elon Musk and, you know, who are CEOs of five or six different companies simultaneously. The reason they can do that is because they're really good at delegating things. They're really good at not doing things that they've, you know, hiring people that can do the things that they're not great at. And they only focus their attention on the mastery of what they know they are already a master at. Uh, you can imagine if you're, if you're an incredible, um, you know, a piano player, Playing more piano will make you better and better and better and better. So focusing your approach, focusing the energy you have on the things that you're going to, you know, excel at, and then uh, changing your approach to things and not having to do everything, but handing off things strategically to people that need, you know, that, that have a desire to want to do those. I, I Listen, my wife is a project manager. She loves, when you look at her chart, her detail orientation and patience are almost <laughs> off the chart. When mine are the, off the chart on the other end, her gregariousness, her logic are completely the opposite of me. Opposites truly attract. It's the reason why you've got to build a team. You cannot do it on your own. But you also don't want to get people that are just like you on that team. You've got to have the people that, that, that make up for your inefficiencies and the areas where you're not an expert. You know, I think it all starts, Derek. If you really want to become a great leader, you really want to scale your business, your life, grow your, become a better person. You have to be willing to change your approach or to be mm -hmm. wrong. You yes. have to be willing to say, maybe there is a better way. Yep. And that is where the letting go, you know, really starts. And that's why I said with you, um, you know, you detested the, uh, that experience. Yeah. But I, you know, knowing you for as long as I know you and as well as I know you, I think that was, you will look back. It's almost like, you know, when I went through, you know, when the, the, the bust happened in 2009, I bought a home here and I moved from New York to here, uh, Arizona, and I bought a home in 2006. And two years, two and a half years later, my home was worth a third of what I paid for it. I had lost my job. I was divorcing from my wife who I moved here with and I had hit bottom. And when you're going through it, it's the worst fucking thing ever. Yeah. Nobody wants to go through that. But when I look back on that, Derek, I look back on that moment in my life and I'm grateful for it because it helped me better understand not only who I am, but you know, how, I want to be and the things I really want to focus on and the things, you know, it kind of really helped. That's where fast growth in that reflection through those difficult times happens. So my response to you detesting it is I would encourage you to reflect back on that a year from now and see yeah. if you feel the same. I think there was self-realization in that, right? I think uh, I've been working on something and it, it's sort of still formulating in my head, but I'll try to articulate it here. And that is, you know, I've sort of made a rule for myself is that that if I have to go a mile, I'm going to walk it. If I have to go more than a mile, I'm going to find a vehicle to take me there. And I don't mean that in the physical sense. I mean that in the business sense. There are things that if it's small and it's simple and I can do it in an hour, um, and it, and it's remedial, maybe it's beneath my skill set, or, or maybe it's just not something that I'm exceptional at. 
I'm going to do it because I need the exercise of doing it. If it's more than that 30 minutes or an hour, I need to find a vehicle. I got to change my approach. And I don't, I don't need to get myself into, listen, I'm doing my taxes for, for, for this last year, you know, and, and I, I have an accounting firm, but I also consult for another accounting firm. I have two full-time people working on figuring out my books. I could, I do it. I could easily do it. It's just way easier for them to spend three or four hours working on something. Call me with questions three or four hours. Again, call me with questions. It's just way more efficient that way. Yes, it costs me money, but I, but I, I know how to make money, right? Money isn't the problem anymore. It's time. And I think you, you've got to come to that conclusion at some point in your business that time is way more valuable than anything else you have. Well, and an glad- hour of time is worth thousands of dollars. So I'm glad you brought that up. So, I mean, kryptonite. So if we're going to ask our audience, you know, what's the point of us talking about this? Yeah. What, why are we even bringing this up? How do we help people? What can we say to our audience that's listening that they themselves can get a realistic, realistic perspective of their kryptonite, both from their perspective and the perspective of others? One of the things I always do with all my coaching clients is I have them ask two people they're close to personally and two people they're close to work-wise to ask them what they think they're unbelievably the the best at and what they are not good at, where they could improve. And then we align that with what they think those things are. And interestingly, while there are, when you do that, while there are absolute similarities, there's usually some things that are, that pop up that are an aha. So what I would, I guess what I'm asking is, how do we help people not only hear what we just discussed, but do something with it in a way that will help them get to the next level with themselves and their business? Yeah, I think there's a couple different ways to do this, Andrew. I think first and foremost, I love psychological surveys like Culture Index and Predictive Index because they will tell you what you were born with, what your innate abilities are. Uh, and they will get deep into that psychology of you and help you better understand that. I think a lot of times people look at those surveys after the fact and they go, whoa, like this is dead on, right? I think the other thing is, is to, when you're performing tasks, think about the energy that you brought into that equation and the energy you leave with. I have 16 speaking engagements in the month of April. That's I'm right. so excited about those. And I just booked another one actually for a big CFO uh, group here in town. And I'm so excited about those. I draw energy from that audience. When I stand up in front of people and I talk for, for two hours, I leave there more energized than when I left. Me too. Right? So, so I know that that's something that I need to refine and become better at. Why? Because it gives me energy. It gives me joy. It actually benefits my businesses. What are the things that I don't? Well, there, there's a lot of Monday, the bookkeeping aspect of my business. That is not something that Derek is going to do. Yeah, uh, you know, I, it, it just isn't. I, I'm not good at keeping track of that kind of thing. I'm, I'm great at, I'm great at analyzing data. I'm great at, um, at asking the right questions, getting people to open. I know the things I'm good at. And I also know the things I'm not good at that I could possibly do. I might even be good enough at them, but I'm not an expert. Listen, I just did an, an, I'm getting ready to leave for an appointment here in a few minutes. And it's for a company that I'm doing some work with. And, and I could have analyzed all their numbers, but you know what? I hired the number one guy in the U S he is an expert in their business. And I literally sent him all the raw data. And he said, what do you want to know about this? And I said, Mark, I don't, I don't have any opinion on it at all. I want you as the global expert to look at this and tell me what this data means. He sent me a 15 page analysis. That's going to literally blow this client away because when they see it, 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 it completely unpacks their entire business for them. Now, could I have done that? I bet you I could have gotten close. But by close, 
I'm talking grenade close, right? I'm, one, of, one of my new terms is splatter pattern, right? I, I, I want to, my wife talks about change management and the splatter pattern of change. And, you know, there's the impact zone where, where, the, where if you drop a can of paint from your roof, you know that right at the impact spot, there's going to be a lot of paint. But there's going to be paint on the dogs, on the birds, in the yard, you know, all over the place. So understanding what that splatter pattern is, finding the things that you are exceptional at right in that core impact zone is what you have to do. And let those other things belong to somebody else. Sometimes I think it's important and I use consultants all the time on Upwork and Fiverr. I'll even do the work myself and then I'll send it to them. And I'll say, hey, can you spend a couple hours on this? Then I will compare my two hours of work to their two hours of work. And I'll go, okay, am I good at this or am I not? Because this is a business analyst, right? A business analyst for call centers, a business analyst for doctor's offices. You know, what did they learn? Into, what can they teach me in two hours? And then I take that and use that myself. I integrate that into my own knowledge base. And then the next time I know a little bit more. So I might even have to upgrade beyond that consultant. Because now I know more than they do. But I think this is, it's truly about finding out what you're exceptional at and what you are just average or above average at and getting rid of the above average. I, I, we talk about, uh, is it Lau, um, who, who said, uh, if you want to obtain knowledge, learn something every day. If you want to obtain wisdom, forget something every day. That's right. right. And that's exactly what, I think it's Lao Tzu that says this, right? So it's, that, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm at the point of my life now, I'm going to be 50 years old in two months. I'm at the point of my life, I'm done with the knowledge thing, right? Now I have to refine this out and peel things off and focus more on becoming wise. And I think this is hard for, for executives to do. It's hard for business owners to do. But again, going back to the one mile, if it's if I can do it in the next hour, I should probably take care of it myself. If it's going to take any more than that amount of time, I need to outsource that and get well, it. hundred percent. And I think this was a valuable discussion. And there is that one other element to it that I would close on. And that is that there's an ego element to your attachment to who you think you are. Mm. And when you look at, this is why psychedelics have become so popular among yeah. executives. Because right? there's nothing, there is nothing like psychedelics to make you gain a perspective that you have never had before and to make you go, oh, wait a second, that's who right. I am. <laughs> I didn't just, know that. Everything that is manifested outside of you is likely a projection from you. <laughs> your relationships, your business, everything. And the more you're willing to let go of your ego, and look at yourself in this non-tainted view, worldview state, the more change that you can create, not just for you, but your people, your business, your customers, your profits, all of yeah. them. And, you know, the Buddha said, and I think I've said it in a previous episode, Speaking of sages, you know, all suffering comes from attachment. How attached are you to who you think you are and, and your approach? And I think if you look at your kryptonite yeah. and detach from the attachment of who you think you are, I think you'll find new pathways. And that's, I think, why Derek and I talked about this today, is to help this was you. A deep, this was deeper than we usually go, but right. it was really good. It's and to I help you find new pathways because, no, no. as Derek said, it's energy versus approach, right? You, you've put in the energy, everybody, but have you really, really looked at yourself to know how to tr really change your approach? And I think... I think this was a valuable discussion today. I do too. I, I think uh, just in closing on that point, I think it's so important. And this is something that I try to do all the time. And, and actually a couple of executives here in town that I hang out with always tell me I'm, I'm anti-dogmatic. And what does it mean by that? Well, it means that every opinion that I hold, um, I believe I'm in a foxhole with that opinion. And I can either advance or retreat from that opinion, but nothing, nothing is stationary. You know, change is the only constant. That's the new ebook that I'm writing right now. Uh, and we talk about this. The only constant in business today is change. 
And, and when you think about your own personal opinions, I would challenge you and say, I don't even care what your political opinion is or what your, what your belief on anything is. Challenge it. Go, go out and, and try to find the, the, the opposite opinion to that and, and, and try, to, try to convince yourself of the opposite. Because when you do that, you do gain a level of self-awareness and you gain uh, a, a skill set that allows you to then to, to really look at everything you do and, and be honest with yourself about it and if it's beneficial to you or not. And Derek, and that, that's is, the key. that is the formula for where we are now in our politics yeah. and our uh, separate views and how we're widening that gap between you're either for me or against me, rather yeah. than celebrating our differences and you know learning how valuable it is to have differing opinions. Totally. Well, and some of that's not even opinions. I think we're, we consume media in a way that, you know, we use our biases when it comes to media and a great example of this. And I know I'm going to get beat up on LinkedIn for it, but just a few minutes ago, a friend of mine posted something before this about the Thatcher mine in Utah and lithium and lithium production and EVs and this whole entire thing. And he, posted all these supposed facts about the Thatcher mine. Uh, the problem is that anybody with Google can find that the Thatcher mine is not currently open. Uh, it's currently under construction. So he talks about this huge carbon footprint and all this acid and all, and ev every single statement that the person made was wrong. Every single statement. There's 1,100 likes on it. And I had to go in there and be like, okay, number one, you're saying they consume all this stuff. They're not even open. Number two, you say they do this. That isn't actually true. Number three, this is completely and totally wrong. And it's like, how did 1,100 people like this thing when there's no basis in reality? And it's because we do not, uh, we, we, we want things to align with our beliefs in ourselves. And I think this, again, goes to that kryptonite thing. We're not willing to see our own weaknesses. And, and one of the weaknesses that every single one of us has is confirmation bias. We want things that confirm our opinions. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, I mean, it, it plays out with everything. You've got to break down the confirmation bias. You have to say to yourself, look, this aligns with my opinion. I think I'm really good at accounting. Let me hire an accountant to come in and show me if I'm actually good at accounting or not. That can be difficult. That's a destruction of self. It's a destruction of attachment to ideas and things. But it's critically important if you want to advance your business and your career to the next level. Great conversation, Derek. I love it, man. Thank you so much. And thank you all for tuning into another edition of The Sauce. Make sure you like and subscribe. Be a part of this. And come to one of our events. Like we're doing these. Uh, is it the second? It's the third? What is third, it? I don't even know. Third Wednesday of every month third. in Phoenix. Our next one is at uh, the third Wednesday in April. I think that's the 17th. Or the 19th, and it's at Desert Rock Winery and Distillery in uh, the Scottsdale Air Park. We also invite you, uh, Derek and I have developed- Yeah, we've got a mastermind now. A mastermind, uh, which includes not only a whole bunch of benefits, but attendance at all of our events, including dinner and drinks. Yeah. So um, just go to thesecretsaucesociety.com. You have to put the the in and join as a gold member. And uh, if you want to check it out first, the events, uh, please do uh, register on the site and uh, come up and introduce yourself to Derek and I. And uh, we'd love to meet you. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all for joining us here on The Sauce. The sauce is the key. We whipping it up. The sauce is the key, we cooking it up. The sauce is the key, we cooking it up.